The Eastern Nagaland People's Organization announced its acceptance of the Government of India's proposal for the establishment of a frontier Naga territory with autonomy in legislation, executive, administration and finance. After a period of 10 years, the performance of this setup will be reviewed to evaluate its effectiveness in meeting the aspirations of the Eastern Nagaland region. The ENPO emphasized that it embraced the proposal taking into account the unity and togetherness sentiments of the Naga community without advocating for the division of Nagaland state. In pursuit of their goal, the ANPO and the seven tribes of eastern Nagaland, Chang, Kemyongan, Konyak, Pom, Sangtam, Tikir and Yimkyong appealed to the state government and fellow Naga citizens seeking their support in fulfilling the demands of the eastern Nagaland people. During Wednesday's meeting, the cabinet engaged in a comprehensive discussion concerning the centre's proposal to establish an autonomous territorial council known as the Frontier Naga Territory. According to the centre's proposal, the FNT will enjoy legislative autonomy with 49 councillors, 40 elected and 9 nominated, as well as executive and financial autonomy. Additionally, the FNT will have its own secretariat and an additional director general of police, it was suggested that there would be an interim period of one year starting from the signing of the memorandum until the FNT becomes fully effective. To discuss on this matter, we will be joined by our associate editor, El Muli, from the newsroom. Hi, El. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can yeah. hear you. All right. Before we move on with this conversation, El, let's uh, go to the history. Uh, could you tell us more about what led to this? What led to the creation of this Frontier Naga Territory? Yeah, I think uh, this subject is too complex and too convoluted to be able to be uh, discussed in a half an hour TV program or two. It's, we used to hear about Eastern Naglen, Eastern Naglen. From during the time we were in school, when we were, in when we were children, so during this time, uh, I think my memory goes back to the early 1990s when there was an organization called the Mon and Twinsang District Students Organization. So during the time we used to hear reports about certain groups from the eastern areas wanting to create a separate state for themselves or at least an autonomous organization for themselves because they felt that the so-called advanced tribes of Nagaland were neglecting them and that they were not getting a share of their developmental pie there. So that was the kind of discourse that we grew up from. But if we look at a history, uh, we have to go all the way back to the Twinsang Frontier Agency when Twinsang, the Twinsang range was practically a separate autonomy, autonomous administration unto itself. And I think most of the contentions that we hear about why the Eastern peoples want to create an autonomous administration for themselves is from the time when they felt that they were not part of the greater Naglet. Naglen discourse here. So uh, a lot of things has a lot of things have happened over the past about 40 years or two and like I said it is very complex. Our community conversations, the policy decisions taken by the state government in regard to education, development and welfare and health sectors in the eastern areas have always been invariably connected with the discourse of neglect and backward tribe, forward tribe. So it is not, it is not just a narrative that, that founds itself on arguments of political instability, political administration, or development. It goes all the way to our tribal and community establishments where we are also interacting not only as political beings, but we are also interacting as tribal beings with each Dif each of us having different distinct cultural identities so the politics involved in this is very complex Atu, and I wish uh, we could have this uh, conversation for like five six hours in one go so that we can really get into it and offer at least some kind of clarity to people who might be watching this but simply put 
this all started when the discourse or uh, when the narrative of neglect by advanced tribes began to gain a lot of prominence and currency within the political conversation of Naglen as we know during the past about 20 years or two. Right, uh, like you mentioned that the Eastern Nagaland, they fell, somewhat felt neglected. Now, this question might be a little controversial, but do you think that the history of blame against the Central Naga tribes, uh, was it fair? It's never fair if you blame someone for your failures, uh, too. Uh, it is never fa fair if I blame people and establishments because of my failures or because of my choices. And I think, uh, frankly, personally, I think it was never fair. And I know a lot of friends from the Ao community, from the Angami community, the Sumi and the Lotha people. And these are things that we don't talk outside in the newspapers, on television. We don't talk about it on Facebook openly. We talk about it in the kitchens when we're having coffee. I think we have been, to be very, very frank here, I think we have been demonized and vilified for a long time for something that I believe we have no blame to take, uh, to put our finger to. We have been blamed for everything, for neglect, for development. Someone sends an ultimatum to the government. It's always about the advanced tribes who neglected them or stole their money and funds. Someone sends a representation to the chief minister or someone wants a new road, someone wants to build a, uh, a clinic in their village. The narrative of the advanced tribe being the reason behind developmental, uh, their developmental backwardness or their economic backwardness or their e educational stagnation, I think that is not fair because if we really look at the history of what the so-called eastern areas and the so-called central areas, I think we have always had at least to a fairly, dis uh, to a fairly proportionate level, all of us had MLAs and ministers each community member we don't have a cause to blame anyone in this because since 1963 we have always had representatives and uh, i think uh, blaming the so-called advanced tribe has never been something that people from the so-called advanced groups such as the Aosumi lotha people would really like to appreciate that because it always makes, I mean, even the policy makers, I have heard people in the government, ministers and MLAs during the course of my career as a reporter and a journalist, I have heard that every time something goes wrong, the advanced tribes are always blamed. So that is why they also don't want to help certain sections of the community. But that aside, I think it has never been fair because like I said, over the past about 70 years, all 60 years, all of us had representatives, MLAs, we elected them. They are responsible for the developmental, uh, development, developmental objectives of their communities, of their areas and their districts. So uh, it, I think we should look into our kitchen first and look at the reasons, study the reasons why the developmental backwardness happened, why the people were not moving forward, where are the funds that you received during the past 50 years, where are your MLAs, and I think we should first question our MLAs, the past and those in the present, so that we wouldn't really have to go into this whole advanced tribe backward tribe blame game. I don't think that is fair in any way, in, in, in any way for both the sides are too. Also moving on, Al, uh, as we know that the main issues raised here was that the eastern areas are neglected. And when it comes to development, now that it will have a financial autonomy, uh, will having a financial autonomy ensure development for the eastern regions? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, considering, considering the way the autonomous administrations in Mizoram, Tipura and Assam have been functioning and the way the performance have been over the pa past about 20 uh, years, uh, Right now, I think for those of us who have been watching policy decisions for a long time, there is not much optimism because there are some people who think that they have been given a separate autonomous establishment that have 
uh, exclusive functional powers entrusted to the local local organization or local leaderships of that particular autonomous area. So the idea is that, or uh, they believe that they will progress, they will develop infrastructure, they will uplift the educational and welfare objectives of that area and achieve them and they will be more developed and progressive compared to other areas. But I think that has always been one of the defining reasons why communities in the Northeast have always pursued the idea of ADCs or uh, autonomous developmental agents, uh, de authorities. So if you look at Mizoram, if you look at Assam, if you look at Tripura, and if you look some of the uh, some of the data and studies, the studies they show the performance of these autonomous councils. Uh, I think uh, it is not about having a different financial functional authority over your area. It's not about having additional financial powers or separate administration. It is all about accountability. Whether you're autonomous or not, it doesn't matter if there is no accountability. So in fact, uh, in 2019, uh, there was actually a research that said that the performance of most of the autonomous councils are not up to the mark because of a host of reasons for being cut from the main administrative artery of the government. So because they have been cut off from the administra administrative artery of the government and they are the ones who themselves decide their welfare objectives and developmental goals of that area, they suffer more. So that is actually what is being said. So right now I think uh, we cannot be too optimistic about this. Uh, whether the place will actually be developed, we'll have to see maybe 10, 15 years from now on or two. Well, before it starts, uh, we can only assume what might happen. But before that, what are the anticipated problems from becoming an autonomous area? And I mean, what are the issues? Uh, first thing, uh, there will be a lot of, and this is one of the commonest reasons why autonomous uh, administrative agencies in India does not work. Uh, in 2019, uh, the central government cabinet amended Article 280 and the sixth schedule of the Constitution of India, which gave greater financial autonomy and resources besides greater functional administrative powers to the, administ uh, to the autonomous areas. But then, um, even though with all these amendments, it was found that, for example, I wouldn't name the councils, but there have been a host of uh, corruption related cases when the autonomous administrations come up, uh, came up. So corruption is one thing because it is not really uh, re regulated. Their functioning and their working and their financial management is not looked after by a centralized authority such as the government of Nagaland or the uh, central government. So there are chances that financial issues will crop up there. And second, there will be a lot of disconnect now that the autonomy, autonomous administration will not be looked after by the chief minister and the cabinet and the uh, state government administration. It will be looked look after by the councillor, the local councillors, which means work will be greater for the councillors because there is no coordination with the state government. It will be with a governor, with a governor's establishment. That is an, uh, another thing. And second, this is not like a separate state. Uh, rather, it is a part of the state's financial framework. So whatever funds they might receive, they will receive it only in proportionate to the population they have now, the current infrastructure status, and let's say the next five-year plan they might have. So it does not necessarily mean that they are going to get all the funds that they desire. And second, uh, this is also a concern that is always associated with autonomous administrations. Financial management is controlled only by a small group of elite leadership groups, which means most of the time the funds or the welfare objectives that the government might have or might project will not reach people who are supposed to be the beneficiaries. So those are some of the problems. But like I said, according to the reports, uh, I think there is a... Uh, 
um, there is supposed to be a review after about 10 years. So I think we will see after that. Uh, hopefully they perform well, whatever the case might be. And I hope it will be great for the Eastern peoples to Atu. Well, now the big question here is what will happen to the quota and reservations for which much division and anger have been caused among the so-called advanced tribes? Do you think they'll still hold a quota? Or what, what are your views on that as well? Yeah, I think that is the... Uh, I, like I have like thousands of Facebook groups, uh, WhatsApp groups in my phone, and nobody is talking about the frontier Naga uh, territory issue. They're all talking about the quotas. So um, right now we can't say much, but now once the eastern areas come into uh, uh, under the control of a different leadership within the demarcation of autonomy administrative autonomy i think there will have to be there will have to be changes within the uh, appointment for example job reservation and state government job reservation policy issues in this regard and there are a lot of people who are saying that the reservation in the central areas should be stopped let us not uh, let us not just uh, forget the reason why organizations like the Central uh, Nagaland Tribes Association came up, why the Central Student, Central Nagaland Students Association came up. These are organizations that came from very, very specific grievances. And one of them is about how certain communities in Nagaland had been de deprived of their rightful share in the developmental, uh, in the job share, in the job market of Nagaland because certain people in the government had always tried to appease certain sections of the community just to keep them quiet. And this anger is still there within the community, especially the Central Nagaland uh, tribe community. So uh, I think the first thing the government will have to decide on it is whether to just keep, uh, keep the reservation, but which I don't believe that the communities will approve of that. So I believe that whatever reservation has already been committed I think it will stay, whether it's in the eastern areas or the central areas. But going forward, I don't think that the reservation policy will work anymore because it is going to cause a lot of wounds and deeper wounds again if it continues to. Right. Also, El, do you think that the constant focus on appeasement of the eastern areas and communities have alienated the mainland Naga tribes? Oh, yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, I keep hearing about this all the time, even within the ministerial circles of the government of Nagalan. It's not just the people, not just the central Nagalan tribes people who are talking about this, but like I said before, just uh, I pointed it out just a few minutes ago, that organizations like the Central Nagalan Tribes Associations, Central Nagalan Students Association, all these central themed organizations came up only because they felt that their welfare their their welfare and their job their their schemes and their share in the developmental objectives of uh, their communities have been neglected because the government was focused too much on keep appeasing certain uh, communities of the state in Nagaland so if you look at some of the uh, developmental indicators and the performance of the Au community, the Lota community, and the Sumi community, it will shock and surprise you, Atu. And I encourage people to just go into some of the data, developmental data from the past about 10, uh, 10 to 15 years, and you'll realize why these people are hurting. The Ao and the Sumi, this Central Nagaland group, tribes, are hurting a lot. And because these are things that are not reported in the media, but if you just go deeper into some of the developmental frameworks, the surveys uh, based on which policy decisions are taken, then you will realize, I think there is nothing, uh, nothing to claim that we are advanced in any way. So, uh, yes, there's a lot of heartbreak and I believe conversations are still going on even within the, these communities that um, if we have to move forward, I think we should just try to, you know, not only accommodate the, 
the neighbor's concerns, but also accommodate your concerns and your interests so that there will be true equality instead of taking something which you did not earn. So I think this is one of the main concerns that we are facing right now, even as we talk about uh, the frontier Naglan territory issue are too. Right, again, coming back, uh, back to the working of the Autonomous Council, now that financial, executive and administrative subjects are in the hands of the Council, will it lighten the Nagaland government's hands in developing the state without excuses? Ah, yeah, talking of excuses, I think, and frankly, if, for example, 50, 15 years from now on, 20 years from now on, the Eastern Autonomous Administration fails in its developmental objectives, if it fails in its welfare work for the community then i think this probably might and i'm not i'm not uh, making light of it i'm not joking this probably might be the first time that we will not be blamed for their failure so it is a very good way um, for the nagaland government to say oh this time okay now you've got autonomous uh, you've got the autonomous status if something happens you don't you don't get too uh, you don't have too many graduates coming out of your schools and your colleges if your roads are bad or if your uh, development if if uh, if the status of your developmental infrastructure in your areas are in uh, are poor if they are neglected then i think you shouldn't blame us in that way, I think it lightens, lightens the hands of the Naglin government in a lot more ways than we can mm, believe, comparative to what it was like, let's say, 40 years ago, 20 years ago. So definitely, uh, now the autonomous establishment will take care of their financial needs. They will administrate all the financial prerogative by their own and they are going to also take policy decisions in regard to their educational sectors in regard to their agriculture production uh, production centers so all these important areas will be decided by the autonomous establishment so it takes a lot away from the hand of the government of Naglin. so it, it, it really lightens their hand but again on the flip side uh like i said the, the funds that will go into the autonomous establishment will come only from the government based on the total uh, uh, eco economic condition of the state as a whole. So the dis distribution of the funds will be proportionate to the, let's say, to the population of the eastern areas and the central Naglen areas. It's n you won't get extra funds just because you're an autonomous establishment. So um, I think there's a lot of work cut out for the autom autonomous establishments in this regard. But speaking of funds again, um, I think the government of Nagaland will have um, fewer commitments in that regard, which means fewer work for the government to uh, to be worrying too much about the areas which come under the uh, new establishment, which come under the new establishment that is the autonomous admi admin administration, because the government will not be directly concerned with their welfare and their development. Atu. Lastly, uh, as it is said that the effectiveness of this setup will be reviewed after 10 years. Uh, the big question here is will the eastern areas be able to show their performance in this 10 years? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I hope it really works out for you because there are people uh, I, I read on social media how they want to return to the mainstream what you call in Assam and Meghalaya mainstream government administration because being under an autonomous establishment they are not experiencing the kind of development that they envisioned when they first demanded autonomy Atu. and this is the case with every uh, autonomous administrations in India. They think they're going to develop and progress not understanding that there is a lot of complexities involved in administrating uh, a political people within a political state within which you have to meet hundreds and thousands of welfare goals for the people. So uh, we'll have to wait and see if the 
Eastern autonomous leadership, leadership in that administration actually deliver on their promises and whether it will be feasible for them. I've been reading comments on social media saying that uh, these people might be back or they might start demanding they want to be back with uh, to, to be under the Naglen, Naglen government administration in 20 or 15 years. We don't know if the whole ad arrangement fits them and if they can make best use of it, then all power to them, all power to them, all the best to them. Uh, I, I don't think that should be a problem. The problem will be if it fails 15 years from now on. All right, El, I think that's all we'll have for today. As you said, we can only wait and see what happens and maybe hope for the best. Thank you so much for joining me today. Right. Thank you for having me, Atu.